This piece of automotive Americana is a Ford GT. And if I could afford one, it would totally be parked next to my Viper. But until that day comes around, looks like I'm stuck building parts for it. So this exhaust tip right here, there is only one of these and there's supposed to be two. Problem is, is he lost one and you can't just go buy a replacement. So I built two of them. And in this video, we're going to show you how I did that and how much I charged. So to get this party started, I ordered a couple of 90 degree mandrel bends from my friends over at JMD Tubes in California. The best part about these bends is the quality and reliability. The stainless is 100% USA made and all of the bending and all of the processing is done completely in house. This particular bend is called a 1D bend, which is critical to getting this part to match just right. Now a 1D bend is classified as having a center line radius that is the same as the diameter of the tube. So this is a three inch tube with a three inch center line radius. In simple terms, well, that's about as tight as you're gonna get. Now, if we examine the factory tip, we can see that it's also fabricated with a tight 90 degree bend, but the exhaust tip itself sits partially on the throat of the bend itself. The exhaust tip is also kind of a strange piece, as it is basically a single wall with a rolled and slanted tip, but also has an inner structure to help support it. It's also super short in length, which is not something you find sitting on a shelf ready to buy. So there's no way I'll really be able to purchase one like this or build a tip just like this one. So my solution is to get really close. I ran up the street to Performance Muffler, which is a local exhaust shop that I often work with. After digging through the exhaust tips they had on hand, we found a pair of double wall slant tips that could easily be modified. After placing the stock tip right next to the new tip, I marked out the point where the taper begins. Now this would make the larger diameter of the new tip the same as the factory tip. The excess of the second mark will be for placing the tip fore and aft on the tube itself. It's kind of like a safety which allows me to trim off a little excess in order to get the perfect fit that I need. The mandrel bends were also marked out for cutting. The first cut will be a couple inches before the start of the bend. This keeps the tube at the correct length and allows us to expand a section for a slip fit just like the factory tip. The second cut will be right at the termination of the bend. Remember, I have a little bit of excess on the tip to place it. A quick trip to the saw makes all of the cut work happen in just a couple of minutes. Now, just a pro tip here while we're at the saw, I see a lot of people talking about this in comments on videos when I reveal my pricing and how I actually make money. It's kind of about the waste of time walking back and forth between the bench and the tools. Now, lots of people tell me that I'm not charging for the time spent walking back and forth. And they're absolutely correct, because in most situations, like this one at the saw, I marked all of my cut work out before I went to the saw and cut all of it out at once. Not wasting time walking back and forth after one part means I get more time in the day to make more money. You just kind of have to keep efficiency in mind when you're doing stuff like this. My grinding table is also located right next to my saw, which means I walked the least amount of distance possible with my current setup. This allows the workflow to continue without wasting a bunch of time walking back and forth. If the grinding bench was further away or like on the opposite side of the shop or someplace stupid not next to the saw, I would lose time, which means I lose money. So consider the optimal flow for your work time to be the most efficient. The next stop on this journey is to expand the tubes for a slip fit. Now this is also sometimes called swaging. The tool I am using is a kind of DIY or build it yourself setup assembled from multiple tools. Normally, entry-level tools like this start around $4,000, but this particular one that I'm using here can be put together for roughly $200 to 600 bucks, depending on how you upgrade it. Now, I'll have a complete list with links in the description for everything if you want to build one yourself. If you don't have the money to buy or build your own setup, just run down to an exhaust shop and have them do it for you. It may be free, or maybe they'll charge you like 20 bucks or something. But either way, you can make it happen. With this kit that I have, it just takes a little bit more time to use because you have to keep on tightening and rotating the part until you get the fit just right. And if you forget to oil it and continue to be lazy by not oiling it, even though you know it won't get stuck if you just take a second to grab the oil, then it'll take just a little bit longer. So in case you didn't get the message here, make sure you put some oil on it. Now, in order to get the new tips to fit up the exact same as the factory tip and be identical to each other, we'll need to build a temporary fixture. The tricky part here is that it cannot be a static fixture since the tips are angled, which means anything that gets welded into place with the factory part will leave it mechanically locked, meaning you can't get it all apart. 
Now, you can build some really incredibly exquisite fixtures and jigs, but I found that the simplest ones are the best ones, especially when you're only going to be building a couple of parts. The design for this temporary fixture involves taking a piece of tube and tacking it to a flat piece of scrap metal, which represents the height and the angle of the exhaust tip. This section will be removable from the base. The base plate will also be a flat piece of metal, with another flat piece welded to the end of it to act as a stop. With the factory tip in place, I can then use another piece of metal angled up to act as an inner stop or a brace. As long as the upper piece is locked in and touching both stops, the angle will be dead on every single time. It's super simple. And now we get to assemble. After fitting all of the pieces in and loosely setting the rotation of the exhaust tip, you can see where we're just a little bit too long. That's gonna have to come off. But that's okay, because we did leave the excess on the exhaust tip for this exact reason. So after gauging the distance that the bend needed to drop, I simply removed that much from the exhaust tip before facing it all off with the disc sander. Attempt number two got me pretty close, but not close enough to call it good. Just a tiny bit needed to come off still, but this time I took it off the bend itself with the bandsaw. It does offset the angle just a tiny bit, but I did also swage out the exhaust tip. I just didn't get it on camera, so it still has enough to slip in there and be slightly loosely fit. The tiny little trim there was just enough to get it to slip in, line up, and get tacked. Now, before welding it, I did make sure to really scrutinize this part, because if I didn't like how it was fit, it would be a lot easier to cut off the tacks than the entire weld. Now, since these pieces are made of stainless steel, Back purging is required. A good five minute pre-purge at about 10 CFH on this little small part did the trick. Welding on the other hand was just a little bit tricky to manage because the now very thin and slightly loose walls of the exhaust tip meant that they would want to blow away easily. Considering that there is very little room to work with if there was a section on it that blew out far enough away to not gain access anymore, the whole part would be scrap so I had to sacrifice the looks a little bit by running a tight and fast weave. Now you can kind of see how I did it here. I didn't get enough room for an arc shot, but you can see my finger is moving back and forth, kind of wiggling back and forth rapidly. And this is to kind of push and wash the pool upward to make contact with the actual exhaust tip itself and bridge the gap only slightly. Now this very precise technique can bridge the small gaps on thin metals like this piece, but the trade-off is that you're adding more heat to the part since you're spending twice the amount of time in the same place. It tends to get a little bit more colorful and the bead profile runs just a little bit wide, but at the end of the day, it has to hold more than anything. There was a solid ring of penetration around the inside of this part, so I'm confident that this will definitely hold. We just got a bit more color and a little bit of inconsistency in the profile but it definitely beats the crap out of the MIG weld that was on the original part. And now we're on to the home stretch here. So before we clean anything up here, we need to add some slits to the expanded section. The slits allow movement of each half when clamping pressure is applied. When the clamps are released, the tube springs back to allow the tube to completely come back off. Without the slits, the tube might likely become deformed and often gets locked on there. Now I typically do these by hand, but if you miss the alignment, it looks kind of rooky. So a trick I use is to take a cutoff wheel or a round disc of metal, if you have it, and put it into the opening of the tube. When it holds tight without you being able to twist one side or the other, you have perfect 180 degree references that you can use for marking your cut. The cut is simply made with a cutoff wheel on a grinder. It definitely takes a bit of practice to get this just right, and I have screwed this up a few times in my earlier years. A vertical bandsaw definitely works better, but just in case you don't have one, this is a trick I still use to this day, and it works every single time. Now, cleanup for these parts is done with an 80 grit flap wheel on the end of an air grinder. Well, for the most part, at least. On the inner lips and the weld beads that are popping through on the inside, I decided to smooth it out and chase it with a stone wheel before smoothing it again with the flap drum. The final finish on the outside was a light brush look with a red surface prep pad. I went with the brush look because it could either be fully polished or coated at that point, but it's uniform just in case the customer wants to leave it as is. And that is how you build a couple of exhaust tips, and that's all I have for this episode. I'll thank you guys for watching as always. I'll catch you on the next round.